Welcome everyone. My name is Julie Garden Robinson and I'm your host for today's Field of Work webinar. This is brought to you by North Dakota State University Extension. And this is the seventh year that we've done the series and we're really glad you joined us today. The next slide shows our upcoming webinars. I hope you plan to join us to learn more about attracting pollinators to your garden, which is a really important topic. That's by Janet Canodal. She's an entomologist here at NDSU. And then on April 13th, we'll have Londa Nowadaki and Anna Barr, and they're from Kansas State and Missouri and South Dakota, respectively. And they'll be talking about farm to school, getting started, and best practices. The next slide shows our webinar controls. Because we have a large number of participants, we invite you to post your comments in the chat. And we're going to practice using and finding the chat box. So click to open the chat. And if you've been on these before, you know what to do. Type your city and state in the chat. So the next slide provides an acknowledgement. As you work on typing in your city and state, I have a special request. This program is sponsored in part with grant funding from USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. And I will ask all of you to complete a short online survey that will be emailed right after today's webinar. And as a thank you, I have prizes for the lucky winners and there's more than one winner every week. So be sure to put your complete address on the follow-up form. And don't forget to include your city, state, and your zip code. Sometimes I have a hard time tracking down my winners and I have to Google them and try to figure out their address. Again, welcome to today's webinar. And I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker. This is his first time speaking with our Field to Fork group. Byron Chavis is an assistant professor and food safety extension specialist in the Department of Food Science and Technology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His research focuses on designing, evaluating, and optimizing antimicrobial interventions for foods of animal origin, and also on characterizing foodborne pathogen growth under simulated product and process conditions. His extension or outreach program focuses on providing training and technical assistance to food manufacturers in food safety, sanitation, and regulatory compliance. He is the USDA FSIS State HACCP Coordinator for Nebraska, working very closely with small and very small meat processors, as well as he serves as the Nebraska lead for the North Central Region FISMA Center, where he provides assistance on environmental monitoring, interpretation of microbiological data, and improving good manufacturing practices. Byron holds a PhD in food safety from Texas Tech University and has been on the faculty at UNL for over four years. So thank you for being with us and it's all yours. Thanks, uh, thanks Julie, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, so thank you so much for the um, invitation to talk to you um, and, and your audience today. I am very excited to be here and I'm very impressed with this um, series of uh, talks and conversations of the field to, um, to table. So today we're going to talk a little bit about developing safe food products. And uh, really what I'm going to cover is very general. So I encourage everybody that has questions to please reach out to me um, with, um, you know, with, with questions about what I'm going to talk about. This is just going to be very general for the purpose of time. Um, but what I really want to cover is, um, you know, the goals that I have is for the audience to understand a little bit about what are the intrinsic and extrinsic factors that affect microbial growth in foods and how those factors interact with one another to either enhance microbial growth or to control microbial growth. And of course, this is important because we know that so many people get uh, food poisoned every year, right? So we have epidemiological estimates that say that maybe one in every six people in the United States get a foodborne illness every year. Every year. 
And of course, we think that that is preventable, right? We want to prevent uh, foods from becoming contaminated. And so, so we work under the premise that foodborne illness is entirely preventable. Um, I'm sure that lots of people in the audience have had food poison, right? I've had, I've been food poisoned that I can, that I can recall maybe three times in the last 15 years. And um, I know that, that, that I know the cause of all of those, of all of those instances. One uh, was Salmonella, the other was Giardia, and the other was Clostridium perfringens. And so, um, so I know that it's very uncomfortable. And so we want to prevent this. Uh, from happening. So when we think about the microbiology, mi the microbiology of food processing, we know that microbes in foods can be good, can be bad, or can be really ugly, right? And so the good ones are the ones that we use for bioprocessing and fermentations and to develop flavors and textures in foods. The ones that are bad are really the spoilage ones, right? So those spoilage ones will reduce the shelf life of the product, but are not really going to cause illness in general. Um, but then we have the really ugly ones, and those are the ones that cause illness um, in humans. Um, and so those are the ones that we really, really want to control for safety purposes. Foods are very complex, as most of you probably know. And so there's a lot of different microbes that interact in, in, food, in food products at any given time, especially when the product is raw, when we have raw agricultural commodities and highly perishable um, food products. So the microbial profile will be determined by a number of different properties, including uh, factors that belong exclusively to the food product, as we'll talk in a little bit, as well as temperature and relative humidity, the gaseous atmosphere around the product, and many others. And of course, as you guys know, microbes can be introduced at any point during food production, right? So either on the field or in food service, during food preparation, during transportation. And so the, the fragility of the food supply in terms of microbial contamination is actually very high, right? We can incorporate microbes at any point. So this is what I was telling you a little bit about before. Microbial growth in food, it's determined by many factors. The ones that are intrinsic to the food products, so the chemical composition, the level of acidity, the uh, amount of moisture that the food product has available for microbial growth is what we call intrinsic factors. And those are the ones that I'm going to be talking about mostly today. When we think about conditions of the packaging and storage environment, that will be extrinsic factors. So things that we can control externally, such as temperature, the atmosphere, basically the amount of oxygen that it's surrounding the food product, and the relative humidity. And then there's other factors that we're not going to, dis to discuss today, but um, are related to the physiology of the microbes, right? So how those microbes are behaving in foods and what are the interventions that we apply to control for those microbes. Okay. So just a little bit of background about how microbes grow in foods. So when we think about microbial growth, one thing that I really want to, um, to make very clear is that not every microbe can actually grow in or on food products. So when we think about bacteria and filamentous yeast and molds, so things that cause illness or that maybe cause spoilage, those microbes can multiply in foods. But when we think about viruses and parasites, those types of microbes don't multiply. Um, so they actually need to be inside of a host to be able to multiply. So whatever amount of, of parasites or viruses we get on a surface or on a food product, that is what it is, right? So uh, those are able to cause illness, but are not going to multiply in foods or proliferate in foods. But for the ones that do multiply, let's think about bacteria as the most common ones. Uh, when we think about bacteria, there are different um, um, segments or, or different stages that they uh, go through. And the one that it's labeled number two, the log phase or exponential growth of, um, growth of phase is the one that we really want to prevent. We want the microbes to prevent actively multiplying because they are going to increase in size. And so in order for us to do this, well, we need, or in order for microbes to do this, to grow, they need a number of different things. They need nutrients. They need a certain level of acidity and moisture. They also require a specific temperature and a level of oxygen. But most importantly, they need time, right? And so when we think about time as a factor for microbial growth, really that, that leads us to this thing called the temperature danger zone. And when we think about danger zone, we've always been told, well, you shouldn't keep foods um, in the temperature danger zone. And roughly defined, that is uh, 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And this temperature danger zone is the um, 
a temperature that will allow microbes to proliferate quickly, right? So um, the growth rate increases, basically uh, they reproduce faster and the doubling time decreases. And the doubling time is the amount that takes the entire population to double in size. So microbes can actually divide very quickly and they divide exponentially. So two cells become four, four, um, uh, become 16, 16, et cetera. So they uh, divide, multiply very, very quickly. So uh, let me see what I was gonna say here. So when we think about temperature abuse, right? When we think about developing products or keeping the products that we already have safe from a temperature perspective, we think about temperature abuse, which is the temperature time combination that allows growth of pathogenic organisms in the food matrix. And so we want to prevent this. And this is why we always insist that people keep foods either refrigerated or hot, right? It's either hot or cold. And we can now assign uh, a value to that, right? So we want to keep them cold, that it's under 40 degrees. And if we want to keep them hot, that is over 140 degrees. So many factors, as I said before, influence microbial growth. And if you are thinking about either developing a product, right, uh, for uh, maybe entrepreneurship, or maybe you're thinking of a cottage food, or maybe you already have a product that you want to put in the market, but you are modifying some of the ingredients and, and some of the conditions of processing, we want to think about multiple factors. And one of those factors is the pH. And the pH is an indirect measurement of the acidity of a food product or of a solution or of anything. The pH scale goes from 0 to 14. And it's a little weird, but the um, lower the value, so closer to 0, that is acidic, and closer to 14, that is alkaline or basic. And when we are around 7, that will be neutral pH. So around seven is the pH of pure water at room temperature. And so when we think about classifying foods based on pH, there are really three um, broad categories. The first one is acid foods that have a natural pH of under 4.6. When we measure that on equilibrium, that's, there's acidified foods that have a um, pH of under 4.6 and a water activity above 0.85. And we'll define what that water activity is in a second. And then we have low acid foods that have a pH above 4.6 and a water activity above um, 0.85. And so this is important because when we think about acid foods, those are naturally as acidic. Uh, when we think about acidified foods, those may be foods that we add acid or we mix with ingredients that are already acidic to bring the pH um, to a much lower value, right? So you guys can see that 4.6 is kind of far from 7, right? So it's kind of far from that, equal of that uh, neutral pH. And so this is what we would call acid foods or acidified foods. And of course, if it has a pH of over 4.6 and it's closer to neutral, that's what we call low acid foods. So it has a low acid level and therefore it has a higher pH. Now this value 4.6 is not completely random, right? So when we think about um, making food products or um, uh, creating recipes and we rely on the acidity of the product, then we use this indirect measure of measurement of acidity, the pH, and that is not completely random. Uh, pH 4.6 is the cutoff value for the growth of Clostridium botulinum. You guys may have heard about Clostridium botulinum as one of the, um, the a very um, dangerous foodborne pathogen that creates a toxic a toxin that it's extremely potent. And it's one of the uh, most uh, toxic chemicals known to humans. And so we want to prevent this from happening because of the public health consequences. So that cutoff value is uh, 4.6. Now, when we think about microbial growth uh, based on pH, of course, microbes have uh, pH values that they like the most, and not all of the microbes grow at the same pH values. There is a minimum, an optimum, and a maximum pH value. Uh, now, some of them, you guys can see that 4.6 is not a magic value, right? 4.6 is a value that stops the growth of Clostridium botulinum, but there are other microbes that could potentially um, survive and even grow very slowly at pH under 4.6. And so the example that I have here is carrot juice versus orange juice. And we know that carrot juice has a pH 
closer to six, right? So we're around six, so it's closer to neutrality, whereas the pH of orange juice is about or around 3.5, right? So that is a, um, a food matrix that um, is inherently more protected against microbial growth because the pH or the pH is lower and therefore the acidity is um, potentially higher. Um, and, and Julie, I, I see questions in the chat. And do you want me to take a look at this as we go or um, towards the end? I will pose them to you at the end of your talk. OK, sounds great. So then when we think about acidity, right, when we think about designing a product based on uh, or controlling microbial growth in a food product that we are designing or a recipe that we are designing based on acidity, the pH is that best indicator for microbial growth. Um, there is a regulation that it's called the juice HACCP, so the HAS analysis and critical control points for juice processors, and this is an, an FDA regulation. And the reason why this regulation exists is because uh, about, I don't know, 30 years ago, um, the scientific community used to think that most pathogens were controlled by low pH, even if the food product was not pasteurized. But now we know that that is not true. We know that there are pathogens such as Shiga toxigenic E. coli and certain types of salmonella and certain types of Listeria monocytogenes that are actually able to grow um, and survive under pH 4.6. And so now because of this regulation, um, all manufactured juices have to be pasteurized, whether that is through a um, thermal or non-thermal uh, treatment. But then that takes us to another significant factor uh, when we think about microbial growth in foods, right? So as, as I told you before, it's a little complicated. There's so many things that interact to determine microbial growth, but this one is water activity. And water activity is the available water for chemical, enzymatic, and biochemical reactions. The scale goes from zero to one, where one is the, the, the water activity of water at um, room temperature in equilibrium and bacteria require really high values of water activity. Basically, they require the water to be really available for microbial, enzymatic reactions, etc. But fungi can tolerate much lower water activities. And that is the reason why we see that dry products, so think about bread, when they spoil, it's typically not bacteria, right? It's typically fungi, yeast and molds, the ones that are actually able to grow in those conditions and produce spoilage uh, because the water activity is low in enough that it's actually controlling bacterial growth. And so that takes us to the point that growth of microbes is different than surviving, right? So a microbe can actually survive in a, in a low water activity without being actively dividing. Uh, and growth is different. For growth, we actually need optimal conditions. And just like with water or just like with pH, uh, there are values of water activity that are minimum, optimum, and maximum for uh, bacteria and, and other microbes to grow. And so this we also take into consideration because um, most microbes require a high level of water activity. So if we reduce the amount of water that it's available for microbial growth, then that product is potentially safer. Although we'll see um, that it, that is not, um, um, as straightforward as it sounds in a second. When we think about reducing the water activity of the food product, just as when we think about reducing the pH of the food product to control microbial growth, there's many things that we can do, right? So I didn't mention this when we were talking about pH, but if you produce a fermented food product, right? So that fermentation process would lead to a significantly higher pH than the original value and that acidity that it's been produced and those acids and all of those chemicals that are being naturally produced by the food product or by the microbes in the product are going to reduce the pH. If you pickle something, right? So you add a certain level of acidity or um, a, um, a chemical substance that it's acid enough that it's going to bring the pH to equilibrium below 4.6. And so we use things like fermentation and pickling and, and other types of acidification to control microbial growth. We can do the same to reduce the water activity when we are thinking of designing a food product. Um, we can, of course, dehydrate, we can evaporate, we can extrude, we can freeze a food product. And all of those things, <coughs> excuse me, all of those things will uh, reduce the water activity of the food product, basically meaning that there's not enough water available for microbes to grow. We can also change the product formulation. And this is one of the most common ones when we are thinking about things like cottage um, 
foods or um, um, you know sp small businesses that are developing products so in entrepreneurship we use formulation and for that formulation we can add salts of different kinds we can add sugar which is one of the most common to reduce the amount of water that it's available for foods and make those foods a little more stable against microbial uh, microbial growth uh, there is a term that you guys may see in the literature or in popular media. It's called the low moisture foods. And those low moisture foods in general, by definition, are foods that have a water activity below, four, uh, below 0.7. Um, and that is important because those low moisture foods tend to be a little more stable uh, when they are in shelves. Okay, so thinking about these two things, these, these two combinations, um, water activity and pH, two intrinsic factors that truly have a great influence on um, determining what is the kind of microbial contamination that we are going to see in food products. I said before that um, dry foods or low moisture foods tend to be a little more stable, right? Uh, shelf stable, but they are not inherently safe. We know, for example, that there are microbes that, are, that can easily survive in foods that have very low water activity. You guys may have seen in the news recently, there was contamination of powder infant formula. And powder infant formula, of course, is a food product that it's designed for a very high risk population, of course, infants and babies. And so we know that the low water activity help us control microbial growth, but it doesn't make um, foods inherently safe, right? So the example that we have here is a raw uh, meat product versus a processed meat product. So in this case, some kind of steak versus a, let's say beef jerky, right? So the water activity of the product is much lower. The, uh, the processed food product has a water activity of point, around 0.86 and the water activity of the raw meat product it's about 0.99 so microbes and the microbial ecology is going to change right so now the microbes that we really care about when we have a dry uh, meat product like in this case would be something like Staphylococcus aureus. We're not that concerned about Salmonella and we're not that concerned about Listeria monocytogenes. But Staph aureus, it's one of those microbes that can actually grow and produce toxin at a significantly uh, lower value of water activity compared to other microbes. And so we know that even though these products are more stable, that these products are not inherently safe, right? Doesn't mean that they are safe. Think about flour, right? So wheat flour, it's one of those things so that we used to think, wow, it's so dry, the water activity is so low. Um, but no, now we know that shiga toxin producing E. coli can be present in that product and survive and make people sick. Think about shredded dehydrated coconut, we see salmonella in those products. And of course, think about powder infant formula where we see Chronobacter sakasakii in those products. So it's a factor to control microbial growth, but it doesn't make it inherently safe, just as uh, pH. Now, the last um, intrinsic factor that I'm going to mention, to mention is biological structures. And this is also extremely important because structures can prevent entry and growth of pathogens. Think about the shell of nuts and the skin of fruits and the egg cuticle and the shell and the membranes. And once we remove those things, then of course, um, we will be compromising the physical barriers and increasing the probability of microbial contamination. That is the reason, as you can see in the picture, we compare fresh cut melons and cantaloupes to the whole fruit, right? So fresh cut produ produce is a high risk commodity. And the reason for that is because we don't have those physical protections that we used to have when the product was intact, right? So, so we know, of course, from a microbiological uh, point of view, point of view that fresh cut produce is actually one of the uh, riskiest um, things, right? Because microbes can uh, easily contaminate a product, is ready to eat. If the product is temperature abuse, then the microbes will grow very, very quickly. And so. Uh, Besides the intrinsic factors that we need to consider when we are designing a food product and thinking about a recipe and uh, thinking about the consistency and, and how stable we want this product to be, of course, we consider pH and water activity of the food product, but we also have to think about external things that we can change. And one of those things is temperature. Most microbes that cause illness will grow at moderate temperatures, and that would be um, room temperature, 
right? So anywhere in the 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, let's say. So that is a really good, comfortable temperature for microbes to grow. There are a few microbes, however, that are able to cause illness, and they are also able to grow at refrigeration temperatures, basically under 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Those microbes, of course, need to be taken care of because lots of food production is uh, or conducted or, or happens under, refrigerate, under refrigeration because it's a really good way to delay the growth of microbes. But some pathogenic organisms can actually grow in refrigeration and we need to take care of those. And so there are specific programs such as environmental monitoring and different temperature controls that we use for these microbes. This one, the next one about freezing is really important. And I, and I hear this all the time from people uh, that they froze the product and so now the product is safe. So we need to be really careful about this because killing uh, or uh, freezing doesn't kill most bacteria. So most bacteria are actually resistant to freezing. Um, a proportion of the microbes are going to die, of course, but once you thaw out that product, once the product is defrosted, then those microbes can actually recover. Now, freezing, deep freezing, is a really good way to kill parasites. And so if you handle any uh, products such as pork, right? So if you have pork um, um, primals or subprimals, right? So if you're handling meat, then um, freezing is a really good way to kill parasites such as trichinella. Uh, or if you're handling any kind of seafood, I, I don't anticipate that that just like in Nebraska that you guys are handling a lot of seafood in, in North Dakota, but who knows, right? And so uh, freezing is a really good way to kill parasites in seafood. Um, but we don't typically use freezing as a step to control um, pathogenic bacteria. Now, we can reduce the rate at which microbes grow and multiply, and of course, we use refrigeration and cooling and chilling and freezing uh, to reduce the speed at which they multiply and make the foods a little more stable. And um, we can also use the other spectrum of the other side of the spectrum of temperature, which will be a thermal treatment. So we can pasteurize, we can cook, we can can or retort, we can, uh, we can bake. All of those things will help us control microbial growth. So now you guys can see that, that this, uh, there's so many factors that influence microbial growth and they don't act in isolation, right? They all interact with each other as we will see in a second. And I believe the last factor I'm going to talk about is packaging atmosphere. The example that I have here is fresh meats. Well, those are processed meats, but they are um, open to the environment. And the uh, picture on the bottom is a vacuum packed uh, set, sets of meats. Right? So when we think about reducing the amount of oxygen, we will change the microbes that are present in that food product. And the reason for that is because unlike humans that we need oxygen, right? Uh, we can even have a, a plastic bag on, uh, in our heads for, for long because we uh, run out of oxygen. So some microbes like oxygen and some microbes don't like oxygen. And some microbes can either do with or without oxygen. But when we remove the oxygen from a package and we vacuum packed and we eliminate the oxygen or substitute the oxygen for another um, gas, then the microbial ecology is going to switch a little bit. Uh, this has lots of implications for quality purposes, right? To stabilize the color and to reduce microbial spoilage, but all for safety. And the reason for that is because microbes such as Clostridium botulinum that I mentioned before, in a really close relative of Clostridium botulinum called Clostridium perfringens, those are very, particularly Clostridium perfringens is a very common organism to cause illness in humans. Um, and those microbes don't like oxygen. So when we remove the oxygen, if you're thinking about having a process that removes oxygen, um, you would have to talk with, uh, with your health inspector about that. But in the state of Nebraska, and I assume that that is, that is um, similar in other states, including North Dakota, you would need what we call a variance for the application of that um, reduced oxygen packaging or a process that removes oxygen. Um, and so we need to make sure that once you remove the oxygen, that the conditions are not conducive to the growth of Clostridium botulinum that could potentially produce toxin and make somebody sick. Okay, so how are these things interacting, right? So I've mentioned the pH, I've mentioned water activity, temperature, oxygen levels. 
all of these things are interacting, right? They don't work alone. Um, and maybe when maybe the, the title of my talk should have been a little different. I think that um, that this is obviously relevant to developing safe food products, but maybe should just, I should have just told you uh, this is going to be about uh, pH and water activity and, and how those things interact. But this is um, extremely relevant, right? So we, um, as an extension specialist, and, and, and I'm sure that it's the same for other people, we get a lot of calls and we get a lot of uh, people that come to us asking us, um, is the pH of this product or is the water activity of this product enough to make it safe, right? So if you are thinking about developing a recipe, developing a product, maybe have a prototype, maybe you want to pilot it, um, maybe you go into a commercial kitchen and, and you want to do some testing and change ingredients and whatnot, all of these things are important to keep in mind because you want to make your product as microbiologically stable as possible because that will potentially reduce the probability of making somebody sick. So all of these things are uh, interacting. And the way that they interact to um, um, reduce microbial growth or inhibit microbial growth is a little different. But I'll give you an example. The example that I have here is for the growth of Clostridium botulinum, which is a very dangerous microbe. Fortunately, it's not very common to find botulism cases in the United States, but um, uh, it is a very dangerous organism. So I'm not going to ask you to take a, a super close look at the table, but the example here is at 68 degrees, right, which is very comfortable temperature for microbes. 68 degrees is good for microbial growth or for growth, growth of Clostridium botulinum. When the pH is seven, so the pH that they tested was five, six, seven, eight, and nine, right? So they go from um, acidic, which would be five, to or mildly acidic to neutral to mildly alkaline or basic. At pH seven, that is also a good pH for Clostridium botulinum to grow, especially when the temperature is comfortable. But if we see the water activity levels, they evaluate different water activity level, levels. And we see that below um, 0.96, there is no growth of Clostridium botulinum. So even if two of the factors are ideal for the microbe to grow and potentially produce toxin, we can use the interaction with the third factor to control for microbial growth. And we see examples like this all the time. We see examples like this, let's say for Staph aureus, right? So where Staphylococcus aureus can produce a toxin under certain conditions of temperature and pH and water activity, especially in the, up in the presence of oxygen, right? So all of, these inter all of these factors interact with one another and we cannot just use one factor to predict, right? We cannot just use one factor to predict um, what is going to be or the optimal conditions for growth because foods are complicated and so are microbes. So when we think about controlling microbial growth in food, uh, what comes to mind is time temperature control for safety foods. And these are foods that require a time temperature control for safety to limit pathogenic growth or toxin, toxin formation. And so they're uh, maintaining these foods at a proper temperature reduces, reduces the probability of foodborne illness. Some of you may be familiar with the food code and the, the model food code that comes from the US um, FDA, from the Food and Drug Administration. Um, Every state has a food code and uh, it, it is typically modeled after the federal food code. Um, I know that the North Dakota food code is based on the 2013 um, uh, US FDA food, uh, food code. So there, there may be some changes. It hasn't changed significantly, but there is some science that has been added since then. But this is an excellent resource when you are thinking about um, developing recipes, improving the safety of your recipes, um, retail and institutional food service, anything like this, the food code is really the, the place to go and it's where the science is at. When we think about foods that require time and temperature control, that can be any animal food or any plant food. Um, and there are specific examples. We have um, sprouts, cut fruits, cut leafy greens, cut tomatoes. Uh, those things need to be refrigerated and only for a certain period of time. Um, otherwise, it will allow microbial contamination if there's any, any microbes present. 
there are other examples that are very historical, right? So think about garlic and oil mixtures. Um, and those are for Clostridium botulinum. And I remember when I was uh, when I was an undergraduate student and even growing up, even before I went into food science, that people would, would always say, oh, garlic and oil, garlic and oil, it's such a big problem. Um, and of course, lots of people don't know why, but um, it is for Clostridium botulinum. Um, now, there's other reasons why the food may be time temperature control for safety, and if a, a food that, um, because of the interaction of water activity and pH, is designated as a product assessment required, um, we'll see that in a second, that is a temperature control for safety um, um, situation. And so the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that there's many different types of foods that have to be um, refrigerated that you have to apply a refrigeration or a hot holding um, to in increase the safety of that product. And we'll see examples in a second. Now, we're not going to go into super high details of this, but there are tables that come from the food code on the interaction of pH and water activity to control spores in foods that are heat treated. Okay. And these foods are also packaged. So there are different situations and this is part of the utility of the food code that you can go and see what are conditions that approximate your process a little better and determine if those two values of pH and water activity interact in a way that will make your product um, non-temperature control for safety, basically shelf stable, right? That it's a little more shelf stable or if it requires a product assessment. And when, when we think about requiring a product assessment is really not, it it's, can get fairly complicated, right? Because uh, foods can be very complex in the way that they interact, in the way that microbes interact in food. And so we need to do individual product assessments for products that have a pH that it's maybe closer to neutral and a water activity that it's closer to one, right? The closer to one, the more water there is for microbes to multiply. And so we want to make assessments and this is for packaged foods. If we go to the next table, this is for foods that are not going to be packaged, um, even if they are heat treated or not heat treated, right? And so sometimes we can classify them as non T, uh, TCS foods, so they are a little more shelf stable, um, or we need to do product assessments uh, to make sure that um, the, the um, interaction of pH and water activity is sufficient to control for microbial growth, or if it's going to require refrigeration, right? So in a lot of these cases, the outcome of this product assessment is that the food needs to be refrigerated, or maybe that the food needs uh, refrigeration and reduced oxygen packaging, right? So when we are thinking about developing products, these are some of the interactions that we want to keep in mind. And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples of um, uh, time temperature uh, control for safety foods. So of course, meat and poultry products um, always have to be refrigerated. There are very few examples of shelf stable um, meat products uh, that are ready to eat that are shelf stable, of course, uh, such as beef jerky, um, things that are dehydrated, right? Smoked, dehydrated, cured. Um, so there's certain categories of meat products that can be um, shelf stable. Now, most seafood, including cooked seafood and sushi, um, if you are a restaurant or if you are thinking of offering sushi at a restaurant that you own, um, it is um, might be the same case in might be the same case in North Dakota, but in Nebraska, you need a HASA variance, right? So you need to have specific permits and specific um, oversight from the regulatory authority to be able to make sushi uh, at a restaurant. Now, most fruits and vegetables and fresh cut produce uh, are temperature control for safety um, because they allow, or it's a, it's a, those are matrices, food matrices that um, uh, where microbes can grow boiled or steamed cereal products such as rice, right? And so we, we know that there are uh, starchy foods that are pretty um, easily contaminated with things like Bacillus cereus, right? And so we can get intoxicated uh, with a toxin. We can get sick with a toxin that it's producing these very starchy foods. And there's many other products such as fresh milk and post milk products. Um, um, some of the exceptions would be fermented, uh, meal, fermented dairy products that are um, a little more stable. And even if left on outside of refrigeration, they're unlikely to cause illness. 
So these operations should be followed, um, should follow required temperatures and times according to the food code. So if you need to have a product that is refrigerated based on the product assessment, then it has to be under 41. If it has to be hot, it has to be above 140. And if you guys remember from the first couple of slides, this is the um, temperature danger zone. We don't want micro we don't want foods to be in the temperature danger zone because that it's where microbes are act um, actively multiplying. When we are cooling a food product, and cooling is extremely important, cooling is almost as important, if not, well, yeah, it is as important as cooking. So when we cook a food product, we eliminate microbes from the food product. But when we cool down product, we are also eliminating other, indirectly preventing other microbes. And so when we think about um, salmonella and E. coli and listeria, we are killing those with the cooking step. But when we come down to refrigeration in a controlled way, we are controlling for things like Clostridium perfringens and Clostridium botulinum. And then of course, let's think about reheating things that are already cooked that has to go to 165 internal temperature for 15 seconds. It is really important to prevent temperature abuse of these products because at that temperature, it's when uh, microbes will grow significantly faster. These are some examples of things that are not um, uh, temperature control for safety. So fully retorted and fully dried and salted seafood, right? So things that are um, shelf stable. Think about processed uh, fruit and vegetable products, such as I like to eat a lot of the um, uh, fruits that are already come in a, in, a, in a little cup, right? That come in some, some juice uh, with no sugar, no sugar added, but I, I love to eat that because um, I'm really bad at keeping uh, fruits and vegetables at, at my house. Um, so those things are shelf stable and therefore are not temperature control for safety. I put them in the fridge just because I like them cold, but they don't have to be in the fridge. Most baked goods, baked goods without a filling, and the filling it's typically the most important thing when it comes to safety, because the filling it's the one that can that can be contaminated with things like Listeria monocytogenes or Staph aureus and produce a toxin. Um, let's see other things: traditional sugars and syrups, right? So those have a very low water activity because there's so much sugar that there's it doesn't really allow for microbes to grow. And then one that it's interesting is hard boiled eggs with the intact shell, right? So if the shell is there, then that product doesn't have to be refrigerated. Um, and now as a food microbiologist, as a food safety expert, I don't like to eat eggs that have been left out for a really long time, even if I know that it has an intact shell, but, um, but it is not a temperature control for safety and it is unlikely if it's cooked adequately, it is unlikely to make anybody sick. Okay, cottage foods. When we think about developing food products, now you guys are expert food microbiologists based on, on this overview that I've, that I've given you. And one thing that it's really important about cottage food, uh, foods, um, the regulations are a little different. I checked the North Dakota regulations and compared those to the Nebraska ones. And I think you guys up there are a little more permissive about what are some things that can be sold as cottage foods. Um, I think in, the, in Nebraska, we're still being pretty conservative about the types of things that we can sell. Uh, but uh, cottage foods really allow small time producers to use appliances in their homes to bake, cook, can, pickle, dry, or candy certain low risk foods for sale. And the low risk is the low risk portion of this um, sentence or this, this statement is the thing that kind of worries me the most because we know as humans that we all assess risk differently, right? So um, if we don't have the tools to make an informed decision, then we will be making uh, risk decisions or risk assessment decisions maybe incorrectly. State laws in general require all other food producers to process foods in licensed kitchens, right? So when we have, you can have licensed kitchens, of course, where you go and do um, 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 different products that um, are under state or uh, maybe local city or tribal uh, regulations. If a consumer buys foods from a neighbor, friend, or even an acquaintance, then that consumer presumably knows enough about the operation to make an informed decision. And that is the value of 
cottage foods, right? So we are buying from somebody that's making something at their home. We know this, we know this person, we appreciate uh, the love that they put into cooking these things. And so I'm going to buy from my neighbor or I'm going to make this and sell it in, in my vicinity, right? And so these are not things that are fully commercialized. Although, just like in Nebraska, in North Dakota, you guys also need to have a label that this was not produced in a kitchen that was inspected, and that is important. Now, one of the last things that I'm going to talk about, um, thinking about those product, producing safe food products, especially at home or for cottage foods or entrepreneurship, anything like that, is food safety hazards. I've mentioned lots of hazards already, different microbes, different, uh, including bacteria and viruses and parasites. And I don't expect you to remember all of those names. But I, what I do want you to know is that the hazard is the actual agent that causes illness or injury. And it can be biological, as I mentioned uh, before, but it can also be chemical or physical. And there is another uh, term that it's highly related to hazard and that is risk, right? And that risk, it's the one that determines if somebody is going to get sick. The hazard is the actual agent that causes illness or injury, but the risk is the probability that we're going to get sick. And that probability is determined by how frequently we find the hazard in the food product and also the severity of the illness that it's caused by the hazard. So not all hazards carry the same level of risk because some hazards will be a little milder, right? So think about an adult, a uh, healthy adult that gets salmonella. Well, you're gonna spend maybe one day, uh, 24 to 48 hours in the toilet, right? Maybe you are gonna have um, a, a, some physical discomfort, but it's going to be self-limiting. But if you get Clostridium botulinum, even as a healthy adult, you can have a, an extremely negative outcome of that illness, right? Um, so, so the risk of those hazards is different. Then do remember that hazard and risk are different things. And then one of the last things that I'm gonna tell you in the last couple of slides is also remember that growth and survival are different things. We've been talking about how microbes can grow in foods, right? So there are optimal conditions for microbial growth in foods, but the non-optimal conditions may allow the microbes to survive. Even though they are not actively multiplying, just controlling for those factors such as pH or water activity may not be enough. And that is the reason why we tell people clean, separate, cook, and chill, right? So cooking to an adequate internal temperature, chilling at the rate that we need to, to do so to prevent outgrowth of spores. Then we want to clean to prevent cross-contamination. We want to separate to prevent, uh, prevent cross-contamination. So all of these things, not only the way that microbes grow in food, but the way that we actually handle food um, has lots of implications for microbial food safety. And then lastly, I'm going to briefly talk about regulatory oversight for food safety when we are thinking about designing food products. Uh, we know, of course, that most of the food production in the U.S. Uh, falls under inspection and enforcement by the FSIS, if it's meat, poultry, processed eggs, or catfish. And the USDA pretty much handles everything else. The, the FDA, um, excuse me, the FDA handles pretty much everything else, right? So they are in charge of enforcing and inspecting for adulteration and misbranding. And of course, they are involved in interstate commerce. So if a food product crosses state lines, um, that, that um, requires federal oversight, right? Um, state inspection is very important in state health and ag um, agencies oversee interstate commerce. Sometimes, like in the case of Nebraska, they can, uh, they can outsource federal inspections for the FDA. I don't know if it's the same in North Dakota. And then there will be other regulatory guidances and ordinances uh, that could be city, municipal, or tribal agencies. And so it's always better to check with the health and ag departments in your uh, municipalities, in your states, to make sure of what are the appropriate regulations that you need to be complying with. And so with that, I think we have maybe 10 minutes for, for questions. Uh, and I will try to respond to any questions in the chat. And thank you so much for um, your attention.
All right. Well, I have a couple questions for you. And mm -hmm. the participants have been helping each other out with some links to other resources. So okay. you might want to check those out as well, such as where is the food code and that kind of thing. But an okay. earlier question was, can a virus, even though it does not multiply in food, be carried in food and spread to humans who then eat it? That's a great question. Um, so, okay. Um, so as we said before, viruses do not multiply, right? So now, can can viruses survive in or an or in or on a food product for a really long time? Yes, they can, right? So let's think about two very uh, popular foodborne viruses. So norovirus, right? It's what we call the two bucket disease. You can be puking and pooping at the same time, which I'm sure it's not fun, but uh, <laughs> but that is the two bucket disease, right? And not everybody gets the, the, the two at the same time, but some people, some people do. Um, so norovirus and hepatitis A, right? So two of the main foodborne viruses and actually some of the most common uh, etiological agents or, or um, um, causes of illness, foodborne illness in the US and actually norovirus is the number one, right? So when we think of all of the microbes that produce uh, foodborne illness in the US, norovirus it's produces about 55% of all of the illness cases in a single year. So it's a, it's a big deal. Now those microbes um, can potentially dwindle in concentration over time, right? But they can also be carried over. And the fact that the virus is present or maybe there's some generic material that it's present doesn't mean that it's going to make people sick over time. There, there are environmental conditions that will determine for how long uh, the virus is going to survive, right? So um, not only uh, intrinsic factors of the food product, such as uh, water activity and pH, but for viruses, things like UV light, right? If the virus is exposed to the sunlight, that will have an effect. Typically when we change the oxygen concentrations, that doesn't really have an effect, but relative humidity does have an effect, right? So the, the, um, there is an optimal relative humidity for, for viruses to survive just because of the structure of the viruses. So the short answer is yes, they can survive for a really long time in or on food products. Now, the infectious portion of the virus or the, how, uh, how much of that population is infectious and can make somebody sick will decrease over time based on multiple conditions, right? And so, so we don't have time to go into all of those and that is very product and process specific. But then the other thing is, can foods act as a fomite, right? Can act as a fomite for microbial contamination. What that means is, can viruses be present on a food product, then I touch the food product and then I bring my hands to my mouth or my eyes and can I get um, sick? Well, it is an unlikely scenario, but it is still plausible, right? Um, we see a lot of those with um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We go under the assumption that um, COVID-19 is not foodborne, uh, but there are some people pushing for the hypothesis that, that you can get COVID by touching a food product that's contaminated and then bringing those to your mouth or your eyes. Uh, and one of the things that we do in my lab is to try to disprove that, that hypothesis. And so we work with viruses that are very similar to, to that. So I'm gonna ask the participants to take a look at your shelf behind you. And there's a little microorganism <laughs> uh, type of animal stuff yeah. thing. What, what do you guys think that is? Which, which one is that microorganism? Yeah, that is my only one. And I really, I really want to have more. I have, a, I have the whole set. <laughs> Is that, e I think that's E. coli, right? This is an E. coli. Yeah. Yeah, there you this go. This is an E. coli. I really, wa I really want to have them all. <laughs> yeah, I have a whole bin of them. Uh, I have another question for yep. you. If food manufacturers want to add a chemical preservative to prevent mold or bacterial growth, how would they decide on the type and the amount to add? And do you know of restrictions on chemical preservatives for the overall food industry? Yeah, so great question. So when we think about the ones that we want to add, the first thing would be to check the regulation to make sure that that is, not, that, that is an additive that it's allowed in foods, right? And so we can go to the FDA or the USDA, and there are lists of approved um, chemical additives for foods, right? So the, the big uh, risk that we, that we run into 
with chemicals is that if you add them at an excess concentration, they may act as a chemical hazard, right? So we talked a lot about biological hazards, but if we um, violate the concentrations or the tolerances of, of that chemical, then that can make somebody sick. So think about nitrites in, in cured meats, or think about benzoates in confectionery or propionate salts in um, um, bakery products and things like that. So. How do we know what is the adequate concentration? It is based on the residual concentration in the product, right? So the residual concentration is really what we want to measure. And so we put, let's say a specific amount and then based on the amount of product that we are producing in our formulation, and then we measure how much is in the residue. And so that is what it's going to tell us how safe um, how safe that is. Now the regulation will tell you what are the ranges of concentrations that you are allowed to use in specific situations. And, and I would advise that if it's something very specific that you can't um, get from the regulation to reach out to your health department or to regional offices of the USDA or the FDA and they will be able to tell you. Okay, thank you. And I wanted to let everyone know that Byron's slides are posted on the events page. So you can take a closer look. He provided some great information to all of us today. And I wanna thank you for that. It's been a very interesting talk and I think that's it for questions. So awesome. thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was great. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.